The Fall Classic starts tonight on Fox World Series Game 1. we got Hall of Famer John Smoltz joining us to preview all angles of Braves-Astros leading up to first pitch. That'll be a fun conversation. The Buffalo Bills back in action this week after the bye. Guess what their odds are right now of winning the Super Bowl? Pro Bowl receiver Emmanuel Sanders joins us at 8.30. Tell us what's working with his team up in Buffalo. And can the three and four Kansas City Chiefs still get the season turned around? Good Tuesday morning, everyone. Welcome to First Things First. Jenna Wolf alongside Nick Wright, who's had a couple hours to ponder things. Chris Broussard, Kevin Wilds. All right, Nick, it has been about 24 hours since that. I'm going to call it a Chiefs debacle. We good now? We babied you yesterday. Are we good now? He we was bitter good. yesterday. I mean, I, I'm not friends with Kevin Wilds yeah. anymore because he yeah. was so rude and no, aggressive yesterday. But aside we're from good, that, not we're great, good. Ladies and gentlemen. Aside from that, we're okay. good. I mean, Wilds was really so just, out of line. Just to recap, that, we're, good. we're good, not great. We'll get to all things football and baseball. We got to start with some basketball out in LA this morning. We are a week into the NBA season already and still not sure what to make of this new look Lakers team. Here's a team that lost two of three out of the gate. Russell Westbrook still figuring out where he fits in. There's been some mid-game squabbling among teammates, if you will. It's not great. Not what we expected and certainly not what Sports Illustrated expected either. They ranked the Lakers all the way down at 20th in their first NBA power rankings. Nick, I know you're already dealing with the Chiefs. I'm not one to add to your stressful week, but what is going on here? Are people overreacting or underreacting to the Lakers' slow start? Well, I mean, this is, and I understand the tiers, the committee's tiers is an NFL franchise, but we might need to expand it to the NBA because this is one of the issues with power rankings. They're reactionary and you look foolish just weeks or days even after you release them. Nobody thinks the Lakers are the 20th best team in basketball. So if if that is where the general consensus is, then that would be an overreaction. But I do think the Lakers right now have one obvious structural flaw and then they have the Russell Westbrook Concern. I want to start with the structural flaw, Broussard. I'll get to Russ later. I, they told us when they acquired Russ that Anthony Davis was going to play center. And a lot of my optimism, I think, Broussard, a lot of your optimism for the Lakers had to do with the fact you're going to have LeBron, AD, Russ, and then two perimeter guys on the court. But then they went and got DeAndre Jordan for no reason. They, I'm fine with Dwight being a rotation backup big, but they're starting these games with an offense that is going to be stuck in the mud at all times. Everything is going to be clogged. Why is LeBron not getting to the rim? Because the whole defense is at the rim because you don't guard Russ. AD is a good three-point right. shooter for a seven-footer, but not a good three-point shooter for the league. And you have a center out there. So to me, and by the way, why would you play that way? Going to be great at defense? Well, they haven't been. Going to be a dominating rebounding team? They've actually been a terrible rebounding team. But the reason it doesn't concern me all that much is the fix is sitting right there. LeBron and AD are your, are your front court. Russ is one of your backcourt mates. And then you put, whether it's Malik Monk, Carmelo Anthony, Wayne Ellington, when he gets back, any of the wings that you have, you surround them with the shooting that you do have. That has to happen. And this odd you know, marriage to whether it be DeAndre Jordan or Dwight Howard is simply not going to work. And I feel like everyone knows it. So I don't know why they're starting the season with it. That, to me, is the obvious fix and one that I would think the Lakers would want to go to sooner than, than later, Broussard. Yeah, I, I'm going to co-sign most of what you said, Nick. And let me start with the tears. I, I know I usually dismantle your tears, and justifiably so. <laughs> However, this, this does show the foolishness of power rankings, especially this early Thank in the you. season in the NBA, where you play 82 games. I, it, it's lunacy. Like, they're going to look foolish in a few weeks for having Charlotte number four ahead of Milwaukee, all right? Yeah. <laughs> Chicago number six, as nice as they look early. I mean, come on. I don't think anybody, even at Sports Illustrated, thinks the Lakers are the 20th 
best team in the NBA and apparently not going to make the playoffs. So there's that. But to what you said, you're, you're right. They need to start playing Anthony Davis at center, and I think they will. I mean, th this can't go on because you are getting absolutely no benefit from ha playing big. Like you said, the rebounding's been poor, and the defense has been horrendous. If there's one major surprise right now with the Lakers, you can't be surprised about Westbrook, right? About it being a struggle, about this being a tough adjustment. We all knew that. All right, Russell Westbrook is the most volatile player in the league, up and down, and you're seeing all of it. He's got the Lakers up with his pace. They're second in the league in pace, Nick. Offense hasn't been the problem in, to yeah. a large degree because Melo and LeBron have been so hot from three. The Lakers are actually the leading three-point shooting team in the league. We know that won't continue at 43%, but LeBron's 48%, Melo's 60%. Once they come back to normal, that's when you'll see more of the Lakers' problems. But Westbrook's adjustment has been very tough. He's, he's shooting 9%. That's not, I, I didn't misspeak. 9% from three. from three. He's got a PER yep. of 6.6. .6, okay? And look, against Memphis, you saw the good. He dropped some dimes. He, I mean, I actually, he's passing it better than I even thought he could early in that Memphis game. But then he, all, he had 13 assists, but at the same time, he has nine turnovers. So that's not a surprise. But while the defense has been most surprising, they don't look like they can keep up with younger, faster opponents. And that's going to be yeah. a major challenge for them, especially if they insist on starting DeAndre Jordan or playing Dwight Howard a lot. Those are the two centers. Go with AD at the center and get some guys that can guard the perimeter better out there and that'll fix a lot of their problems well look I, I think if they play good defense they're about to rattle off four wins in a row they've got spurs thunder Cavs, rockets here those teams are a combined four and nine if they play good defense and they sort of let mellow play a little bit less and nick i know we love mellow we both are <laughs> you know love to see mellow hitting jumpers the reason that mellow was out of the league is because it's not because he couldn't hit jumpers he can still hit shots. It's because he couldn't play defense. But you were a big, right. big, big guy on this last year. You were like, ah, Lakers defense, defense wins championship. I know it's a small sample size, but can we show the numbers of the Lakers defensive rating? Specifically, their second, uh, second chance points. Memphis was all over the boards getting a bunch of second chance points. I don't think AD is going to move to center. It's one thing that's consistent about him. He said he doesn't yeah. like playing center. The idea that all of a sudden he's going to want to play center. So do you think this is a major concern or just too small of a sample size, Nick? Well, listen, I think the defense is going to struggle considerably the first couple months of the year because it's such a new roster and being remade around the strengths and weaknesses of Russ. And so I think the defense can be excellent by the end of the year. So I'm going to be more interested in what the defensive rating is kind of by month. The second chance points allowed thing speaks to my point about rebounding. They have been an awful rebounding team, and they're playing huge. Like, that can't happen. Yeah. Even when they won the title and they had, like, JaVale McGee, why is he out there? Well, he can catch lobs, and he's going to help you on the boards. Like, you can't be giving up spacing and shooting for size and be a bad rebounding team. But I want to talk about Russ for a second here, Broussard, because I don't think the – you're right about the pace, and he's not going to shoot 9% from three all year. But I think we have to recognize that Russ is going to take a while. But once he gets going, he can be excellent. Look at what he did in Houston and Washington. Again, new teams, first three months, rest of season. Houston, he's 24, 8, and 7, first three months on 43%. Rest of the year, 38, and 7 on 52%. Washington last year. He was terrible the first three months of the year. And then the rest of the year, he was 24, 13, and 13 as he tried to carry them to the postseason. So I think Russ is going to take some time to get acclimated. I think that we now have a pretty good history of that. The question is, 
can the, you know, what do the Lakers do other than Russ while he gets acclimated? And I think the obvious choice is to not be playing these DeAndre Jordan lineups. This is in a weird way, Broussard, why a Kevin Love buyout is actually semi-important for the Lakers. Because then, you know, if you put it in quotes, Anthony Davis doesn't have to play center and Kevin Love can be out there, but then you're spacing the court, which is obviously yeah. what they need more of for LeBron to be able to thrive the best way he can offensively, Broussard. Well, I don't know I how much LeBron's going to drive anyway, okay. Nick, but we'll see. We'll see. See if okay. the Lakers have anything figured out. They're in San Antonio uh, tonight to play the Spurs. Talk some Baker Mayfield now. The Browns are ready to pay Baker the big bucks, but would it be a big mistake for Cleveland to extend the former number one overall pick? We'll talk about that next. First things first. Speaking of quarterbacks, let's head to Cleveland now. Baker Mayfield still sidelined with that shoulder injury for the short term, but for the long term, the question remains. What should Cleveland do with Baker? According to a report, the Browns are still willing to pay their quarterback in the mid to high $30 million per year range, which would put him in line with the likes of Patrick Mahomes, Josh Allen, Dak Prescott. Hey, Broussard, you went around on the Browns giving Baker another big contract. I'm out on it for now. And look, being a Cleveland native, I, I understand and appreciate that Baker led them to their first playoff win in 26 years. So there's something to be said for that. But let's keep it real. He just hasn't shown enough to make me say, this is my quarterback now for the next five or six years. Nick, you are big on ranking the quarterbacks, you know, that you're going to have to beat yeah. going forward. Well, we got Patrick Mahomes, Lamar Jackson, Josh Allen, Justin Herbert, Joe Burrow. That's five yeah. that I think are definitely better than Baker going forward. I didn't even mention Derek Carr, and maybe Trevor Lawrence comes up in there, and two of them are in this division. So I've got to see more from Baker before I sign up for him. And, and obviously the Browns are in win-now mode for the next few years. Well, this offseason, honestly, I am kicking the tires. On Aaron Rodgers, especially if Mike Tomlin's going to USC, right? I'm kicking the tires on Aaron Rodgers. I'm kicking the tires on Russell Wilson. And if Deshaun Watson isn't traded in the next week and a half and he gets through his legal issues, I'm kicking the tires on him. So I, I'm seeing if I can get one of those guys. If I can't, then I let Baker play out next year on a prove-it year. And then if that's not enough to show me I want him, then I'm franchising him for another well, year. So I've got at least two more years of he can prove to me that he's my long-term yeah. solution. So I'm out. But so he, the reason I'm in is because of the number. Mid-30s would not put Baker in the Dak, Mahomes, Josh Allen category. Like, Deshaun makes $39 million a year. Dak makes forty. Josh Allen makes forty-three. Mahomes makes 45 on average. Kyler's about to get a new deal. He's going to be in the 40s. Or in a year, he'll get a new deal, I should say. Lamar's going to get a new deal, I would imagine. He'll be in the 40s. Matt Stafford's deal, they're probably going to give him an extension after this year. He'll be in the 40s. So what neighborhood will Baker Mayfield be living in? The Derek Carr, Kirk Cousins neighborhood. When Carr gets his new deal, it's probably in the mid to high 30s. Cousins' deal is already in the mid 30s. That's the neighborhood he should be in. So I'm in on uh, on these states where if you're because you, the franchise tag makes sense if you think you're ultimately going to have to pay the guy in the mid 40s because the franchise tag right now for the quarterback for next season would be around 40 million dollars. So and I understand you wouldn't have to do it for two seasons for Baker because you have him under contract next year already. But at this price, Wilds, I'm in on it. Now, there is a number where I would be out yep. on it, but he would be in the upper middle class of quarterbacks, and that's when I'm ranking quarterbacks where Baker is, in the upper middle class of quarterbacks. He is right there with Derek Carr and Kirk Cousins right now, and I think he could be paid accordingly. So at these numbers, Wilds, I'd be in on it. Yeah, so Kirk Cousins making 33. If I'm Baker and I see a contract in front of me for 33, 34, I would sign it or even a savvier move. So you know what? 
I'll take 31. I'll, I'll be more in the Tannehill range who makes 29 and a half. Because you know why? Baker has such an elite personality. He can make up all of that money through endorsements and broadcasting if the Browns won a Super Bowl. Is he an elite quarterback? Mm, probably not. Does he have 10 times as many commercials as Josh Allen and Russell Wilson? He does. The guy is like so magnetic. If he won a championship and added it to his title of being the best acting quarterback, Jenna, I know you get a little bit upset with the commercials, Jenna, but he is a wonderful actor. No, he could be I a superstar if it's he got football. a ring. So I would actually leave a little bit of money on the table and go get some more commercials. Yeah, right, it, go I, I ahead, hear Bruce you Hart. guys go on ahead. the money. Well, I hear you on the money. And yeah, if Baker's going to take $32 million a year, sure. All right, but will he? I, I don't think he will. And then furthermore, Nick, the bottom line is, do you think he can lead them to a Super Bowl? Is he the court? Because that's essentially what we're talking about. Even if the money is less, can he lead you to a Super Bowl? That's the question. Where are you at on that? And and to me, where he is as a player this moment, the answer is no. Do I think he will continue to grow and evolve? Do I think that he's going to be That's finally right. in a stable situation as far as coach and offensive coordinator after having all that upheaval year one, two, and three? Yes, I think that will help him. And, and I also think this year it's maybe a little unfair to evaluate him in that he was playing with an injury from before we knew it and then has been trying to gut through it. And so I wouldn't... I would not want to make Baker one of the five highest paid quarterbacks in football. But if no. he's in if, with the way the market's moving, if he's the if he's the ninth highest paid quarterback and he's the twelfth best quarterback, I can Wilds, I can deal with that spread. If he's you know a touch That's overpaid, I can deal with that spread for the stability of the position. And if you're the Browns, you know it's not as easy as we'll just draft one. They spent 30 years trying to get a quarterback as good as Baker. Now he's not as good as the best quarterbacks in the AFC, but he's better than any quarterback they've had in forever. So I also think there's a risk for the Browns of not locking him in, if it's a reasonable number. Look, I, and I and I don't think Cleveland, like God bless Cleveland, I'm a Joakim Noah, like you want to take your family on vacation in Cleveland. I personally like Cleveland. I think Cleveland rocks, Jenna. But if Baker leaves a little bit more money on the table so you can ha attract a few more free agents or, or overpay a little bit to go deeper into the playoffs, I think that works too. Also, doesn't need that much money. He lives at the stadium, as we saw from the last commercial, Fair which was point. commercial number 100 point. that he's done. So we're all good. Hey, there you that go. Rent's expensive. Uh, let's set football aside for now. Facts. That's all I do here. At the end of the break, I'll just give you a fax, then I'll send us to commercial break. Hey, the World Series starts tonight. It's tonight here on Fox. I keep saying here. We're all one big happy family. Hall of Famer John Smoltz is going to be on the call. And lucky us, he's going to join us next to talk all things fall classic. This is First Things First. Back after this. Tonight, the World Series begins with the Braves making their first appearance in over 20 years while the Astros look to reclaim the crown. Game one tonight, 7.30 Eastern on Fox and the Fox Sports app. And joining us now, a guy who was on the last Braves team to make it to the World Series, also on the last Braves team to win the World Series. And tonight, he's in the booth to call the World Series. Hall of Famer John Smoltz joining us live from Houston. John, good morning. Thanks so much for being here. Uh, you were, I would say, the epitome of a big game pitcher. 15-4, uh, 2.67 ERA in the postseason. In the World Series, these numbers, 2.47 ERA in eight career World Series starts. Who better to ask than you? What is the spotlight like for these guys getting ready to go out there tonight? Well, for the guys who have had a chance to do it before, it's a lot easier. But when you do it for your first time and you're in that moment, you prepare yourself as if it's just another baseball game, but it's not. And that's the beauty of the postseason. The heartbeat of certain players, they're not all robots. They don't all think they're alike or, or feel alike. And you're going to see some jitters about, I don't know, a few times, and then you learn how to slow your heartbeat down. I love the moment. I wish there was more of it, and I'm spoiled. I had 14 years of it uh, being in the postseason. So I love watching the game 
and trying to pick out the moments that might get somebody to do something they would never do in a regular season game. The crowd always is standing with a man on first. It's a rally in the regular season. Mm -hmm. It's nothing. All these things are magnified. That's what makes it an unbelievable event, especially a best of seven. And I'm looking forward to it, even though, of course, the whole world knows that I played for the Atlanta Braves. But I've been doing this broadcast (laughs) gig uh, for a long time, so I'm sure uh, I'll get a lot of heat either way. Well, listen, you, the, you, you, I think anyone that's watched you knows you're going to call call the game, so to speak, fairly. Right. But it also, for you, like you said, you're a legendary Brave. And so I would imagine when in your private life, personally, they, they still hold a very special place in your heart. So friends and family three months ago would have said to you, hey, how do you think the Braves are? What, what chances do we have? If they would have asked you that <laughs> right after Acuna went down. What would you have said then? And I guess the fu- the next part of it is: Are you? A- I'm shocked they're here. I was shocked they went all in, right. seemingly at the deadline, knowing Acuna was hurt. When it looked like okay, Dodgers, Giants, one of them's going to be there. How surprising is it that it's the Braves in the World Series, especially doing it without their best player? Yeah, very surprising. Um, You know, Brian Snicker, who's been in the organization forever under Bobby Cox, I'm not surprised he's led the team to the postseason. The general manager, Alex, did a great job kind of reshaping the outfield. But, you know, there's sometimes we kind of have analytics information for everything. But, you know, what we don't have and we can't measure is the it factor. That small little word that you hear sometimes from baseball or football it's the it factor that they have in that locker room and with that manager that allowed them to stay kind of steady the ship. When you come out of the second half, all right, and that's when you're supposed to make your move, and you have 17 or 18 straight games where you win one, lose one, you sometimes think that might be your identity. But they weren't confined to that. Their two best outfielders went down. Their whole outfield went down. I think from that it factor, and they had something that last year helped them. You know, they had a three-to-one game lead against the Dodgers and blew that yep. lead and lost that, that, that series. I think a lot of that went into this year, and then, of course, the toughness of some of their players. Uh, this is, this is going to be a great battle of infields. The Houston infield against the, the, the Atlanta Braves mm-hmm. infield. Two of the best infields in baseball offensively, and defensively, and that's what I'm. I got my eyes on to see who wins the infield battle. John, let's put you back in that Braves uniform. If you were pitching for Atlanta in this series, how would you attack the Houston lineup? It's really the best offense in the league. How would you go about attacking it? Yeah, that's what um, you know. I, I try to do when I do a broadcast. I, I do a lot of studying as if I was facing each team. And I try to set the stage for the viewers to give them an insight of what it would look like to uh, attack this lineup. I agree. I think Houston has the most incredible lineup with little holes. You know, when you take a lineup card in a big game as a pitcher, you mark down who you don't want to beat you. And you could arguably mark down more people in this lineup than anyone else. Then you also mark down who do you go to to get the out, the strikeout. Um, This is a stingy offense. And so... What I would do, would I would definitely want to attack their lineup, throw enough strikes to get them on their heels a little bit, but they have enough guys that swing at the first pitch and get damage done early. So it's a creative way, and I, and I wish I had that challenge. I, I, w- I think it would be an, an incredible challenge. It's similar to the Cleveland team that we faced that had some thump in their lineups. That's going all the way back to Manny Ramirez, Jim Tomey, and Eddie Murray, and Kenny nice. Lofton. And I think those those Bell. what yep. presents the greatest challenge for anybody who has to face the Astros is what you just asked. John, how if the Astros were to win, how historically great is this team? They went to five consecutive ALCSs. This is their third World Series in five years. And I think we sort of like seen the Astros, oh, they're a nice little team. They got better and better and better. If they win this year, or do we have to all stop down and be like, hold on, are we looking at a historically great ch- uh, team, like a dynasty, a little miniature dynasty, if they win the World Series this year? I think if you throw in the mix everything that they've gone through from an organization 
changing leagues, rebooting their roster, setting up for that Sports Illustrated, we're going to win in five years, and they did. Um, I think Mm -hmm. winning this year would ease the pain of all that they went through, especially with, you know, the controversy of a couple years ago. I think it would give them credibility. I think, you know, people are going to think what they want to think and do what they want to do when it comes to the Astros on, on everything that came out a couple years ago. And, oh, by the way, they weren't the only ones. I think that's what their chip on their shoulder has been and should be. I think Dusty Baker would it would it would give him the the jewel that he's been so desperately wanting and what an incredible job and oh by the way two older managers in a young game leading their teams to the postseason so i think it would go a long way if they won this world series to have people stop talking about what they didn't do or what they did do to get a championship but you're right this is a uh, a talent that has uh taken over the last six seven eight years of really playing great baseball and getting themselves in positions to win a championship. Let's stay on the Astros for a second, John. During one of the games, I'm not sure which one, but a graphic popped up on the screen and I said, oh my God, maybe I should have known that, but I didn't. Jose Altuve, third all-time postseason home runs. I said, geez, like third all-time, and I understand there's more postseason games now than before. It's not totally fair comparison, but still... It's a remarkable accomplishment. Unfortunately, and I used to cover the Astros, I know Jose a bit, he's a really nice guy. He, he more than anybody, seemed to be tarred by the scandal because of the Jersey stuff and the allegations there. As a baseball lifer, if the Astros close this out, or even if they don't, what's your view on Altuve, historically speaking, and what type of, is such a unique player, what his legacy, if you will, has been and will be. Yeah, he has been such a great player. And anytime there is a cloud surrounding you, I know personality wise, you're going to it would it would it would crush me. Um, And I think that's kind of to your first part of your question, what happened with a guy who cares very much about the game and he set the standard for not only his height, but the 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 yeah. power he generates and the ability that he has. And I think it would go a long way that, you know, when people look at you and look at your body of work, you know, one is going to assume, well, was this all the time? And I don't think so. And look, the game in and of itself usually heals the wounds wounds if you continue to play uh, really good baseball apart from all of this cloud that was over or instantly put over your head. So I, I don't think over time people will look <clears throat> at that situation and see it as that's the all only the the whole time that that's what happened. I don't believe that. I think it's an isolated situation in a gap of time where a lot of teams were using technology, where a lot of people were trying to gain an advantage, and that's kind of the byproduct and problem of technology when you use it incorrectly or adversely to uh, affect your chances. So uh, I know I I love the game and I'm a guy who played the game right and I and I believe in that and I don't think that will cloud these guys if they if okay. they were able to continue to show greatness like they have over the let's just say the next two years um, even if they are right. unable to mm-hmm. win this year. All right, we talked about the Astros historically. Let's finish up with this. Finish this. Finish this sentence for me. If the Braves win the World Series. It'll be because blank, John. Wow. Uh, That's a great question. It'll be because of their pitching, a starting pitching, which they didn't have last year, which they went out and got a Charlie Morton. Max Fried has come into his own, an Ian Anderson. You know, pitching is scarce this year. We've seen in the postseason Johnny Bullpen's having to take over. Um, And I think that would be a, a... a reason why they would win the World Series because they didn't have that last year. They had to piece it all together. And I think that their pitching, which ironically has been what the organization is known for, uh, I think they finally got back to that kind of um, you know, effort, if you will. And I think that would be the reason. Because I don't know that you can shut yep. down the Houston Astros, but I think if you can control their big innings and their crooked numbers – it, it kind of takes the sting out of their ball club. But they're a complete ball club, and it's going to be a great World Series. 
Nice. Well, John, this is going to be a special one for you to call. We uh, very much look forward to hearing you on it. Thank you so much for spending some time with us this morning. This was great getting us all primed and ready to go for tonight. Enjoy the series. Try do, do us all a favor. Don't run out to the mound and try to do things on your own. Stay in the booth. Let those guys do those, their thing. You do your thing, and we'll do our thing by just enjoying you on the call. Uh, speaking of, here's the pitching matchup for tonight. Charlie Morton on the bump for the Braves. You got... Um, from here, Valdez for the Astros World Series game one tonight, 7.30 Eastern on Fox. John Smoltz, thank you again. Good luck. Have a great rest of the day. We have to take a turn and get back to some basketball. The Nets won last night despite mm. James Harden's continued struggles. Can the Beard still be an MVP caliber player with the new rules in place? Toss that around next. First things first, NBA champ, Antoine Walker. This video looks like it's all black and white, except for four red jerseys. Uh, the uniform, that floor, the whole bit with Brooklyn. Probably Let's talk not. about those Nets. Picked up win number two last night over the Wizards, but it was despite another tough night at a James Harden. We talked yesterday about Harden being the poster boy for those new uh, NBA rules, NBA's new rules. Finished with 14 points last night. He was just one of eight from deep. He only got to the line three times. It's been a troubling early season trend for Harden. He's not getting the calls to get to the line like he used to. Points per game down a full 12 points off his career average. The almost seven fewer free throws per game, a big part of that. So, Antoine, should the Nets be worried about Harden's ability to adapt to the new rules? I don't think they should be worried. I mean, I've been very critical of James Harden and, um, you know, over the last year and a half. Um, but one thing I can say is that he's the probably arguably um, the best one-on-one -on -one player, um, at least top five all time. So he, he'll, he'll figure it out on the offensive end and be able to get to the foul line um, back the way he used to. I think with James Harden, it's about getting his legs up under him. If you really think about it, his three-point shot is off. Um, that come from legs. I think also getting to the basket and being able to finish and not look for fouls. That comes from having, you know, getting his legs up under him as well. We're only four games in, so I'm not going to um, go too hard on him and think that he has to make these massive adjustments because he's going to have the ball in his hands and he'll get better. I like to look at those numbers 20 games into the season and see what James is at, but he'll get back to that. This is a guy that's going to be a future Hall of Famer, um, one of our best one-on-one -on -one players of all time. Um, so he'll figure it out. It's going to take some time because he was one of those guys that benefited from the old rules of being able to use his body and use his legs and get to the foul line, and they're, they're taking that stuff away. So he'll, it'll take a little time and adjustments for him, but I think James Harden will be just fine. Yeah, I, I don't know if he'll be just fine, and the Nets won't be fine unless he's great. And so he'll be better than he's been because what he's been through four games is awful. Ah, Nick, you're being too harsh. Well, he literally leads the NBA in turnovers, and he literally is dead last in field goal percentage amongst guys who have taken as many shots as him. So he's turning the ball over more than anyone, and he's missing shots more than anyone. As a wise man once said, that ain't great. And, I, you know, we can debate whether or not the Nets have a quality top-to-bottom roster, Another time, Broussard and I disagree on that. I think Antoine agrees more on Broussard's side of the equation. But what we all agree on is, with no Kyrie, their path to the finals is very simple. KD and Harden both be superstars. And Harden is right now uphill battle to look like an all-star. And here's the question I would have for you, Broussard. Do, do you judge Rodney Harrison to mix sports differently because he wouldn't have thrived as much in this era? Because I don't. Like Rodney Harrison played safety at a time where you were allowed to crush people and the, the rules changed. Mm. He was uh, on his way out of the league. He's still an all-time great safety. Well, what if the rules changed on Harden and it's going to take a while if it's at all possible to adjust. Like we see it in football and we don't bat an eye. Like, oh, okay, that guy played that way in that era. This is a major change to the league with Harden at the epicenter of it. Why would the expectation be he's gonna be the same player when we all recognize 
getting to the line was what he did better than anyone in the league. Here's the difference, Nick. Even when Harden was getting to the line under the old rules, people didn't like it. People thought he was darn near cheating, right? That he was forcing contact, mm -hmm. that he was a great actor, that he was able to get these calls when he shouldn't have. It's not like you just take out the three-point line or you eliminate the three-second call in the paint, whatever you want. Those sure. are different than the feeling was he was getting away with murder anyway, so to speak. And now you take that away and he's not the same player. Look, if James Harden falls off the way you seem to think he will, Nick, I mean, this is like, like the Wizard of Oz when they found out the Wizard <laughs> of Oz really wasn't all that. I mean, really, like if we find out that James Harden really is like, you know, he's an all-star, but he, he really ain't all that. I mean, this is huge, and I agree with you. The Nets would be in deep trouble. I'm more with Twan. I think it's the – even Cardin even said after the uh, two games ago, I don't have my confidence back yet. And I think that's about the hamstring. That was his first major injury of his career. When he did come back last year in the playoffs, he re-injured it, and he hasn't been the same player since. He's tentative. He's not looking for his shot as much. He's not able to finish as well. So I think once he gets his full confidence back in his legs, Nick, then he will be the guy or, or very close to the guy he's been for the last decade. I, I have full confidence in that, Wiles. And if he isn't, my oh my. <laughs> I know it's dangerous. Well, it's a, it's a two front attack on his game, right? So they're taking away his sort of like spread his legs, three pointer foul. And just to put some numbers behind it, courtesy of Dusty, since Harden joined the Rocket, he drew 484 fouls on threes. That's more than Dame and Steph combined. So this wasn't just like, oh, he's a little bit more than the next best guys. Like, he's more than Steph and Dame combined. The other thing is going to the hoop and doing these like little rip through moves where he's actually got moves designed to draw fouls. So Antoine, my question for you is this. How much of that is decision making where it's like, all right, I can't do that anymore. And how much of it is muscle memory when he gets to the, when he drives, like he's just so used to doing it that it's muscle memory and he's not going to be able to adapt as fast enough, no matter how he, much he knows that the refs are calling it differently. I mean, he's a unique player. These are the moves that he's practiced and that may have some truth to it. These are moves that he's practiced for the last six, seven years, being one of the most dynamic scorers in the leagues. And, and obviously he's got to change us some things. So I do think that has a little truth to it. And just to add on to it, I think, you know, for hard, it's got to be a mental thing, too. He has to understand that and that he has to be that guy again. This has to be 25 to 30 right. points a night. Um, they don't have Kyrie. Um, and I think that's what Brooklyn did a terrific job of not allowing Kyrie to come in and out the lineup. Hard has got to go back to being James Harden, MVP James Harden. He has to take on that responsibility and go along KD and put up big mm -hmm. numbers. This is not the same team without I, Kyrie. That's a big missing correct. piece uh, from top to bottom, and they need him to be aggressive. And I want to add one other thing about what Wilds was saying, which is Harden had manicured his game in such a brilliant way. Now, forget the three-point fouls, which were he was better than anyone at ever at drawing them. I feel like one of the reasons he was so successful on plays he didn't get fouled, drives to the basket, was because guys were afraid to foul him. Oh, and so take. I just think yep. there is a domino effect of he's not getting to the line and he is being defended more effectively because guys are not as afraid that he's going to get one of these jabroni fouls that he had perfected. I don't judge it, you, it, the, the goal of athletes, Broussard, is to figure out the rules of their sport and how th the most effective they can be within them. I don't negatively historically judge him for basically breaking the rules, not breaking the rules, breaking the system in a way that benefited him more than anyone ever. I think it shows a basketball brilliance. But I also think that it is incredibly difficult to change things up after you've done it this way for a decade. And for almost everyone else, 
it's the opposite. It's like, oh, I now am more comfortable because I had to I have to guard every great wing scorer one way. And then when Harden comes to town, I got to deal with all this nonsense. And I, they got to <laughs> remind me he's not even going to try to score. He's going to try to do this stuff. And, and again, that's not it. You know how, how high I've spoken of James Harden's skill level. I just think this is a specific thing that is going to be incredibly damaging for him. And through four games, it obviously has Nick, I, I am dismissing all of the praise you've given Harden in the past. <laughs> I'm the, it's gone. All right. You clearly think that under the new rules, he's Spencer Dinwiddie or Dennis Schroeder. No, like, I you, don't. you don't think he's special no. anymore. You don't <laughs> think he's special anymore. That's what it sounds like you're saying. He is no, still I special. Think you, you, I'm used a guy, to that. you used a guy the other day. Hold on, just real quick. You used a guy the other day. You said Zach Levine. And he's obviously a far better passer than Levine. I don't know if under the new rules he'll be as good of a scorer. I do think there's a chance that under the new rules, James Harden's an all-star and not close to an MVP candidate. And I, Bruce Hart, I think that screws the Nets. I think that absolutely unequivocally screws it the Nets. It would. It, it, we well, agree on that. Key. If he's not that, you're, you're absolutely right. The new rules not affecting KD, who's the only one keeping the Nets in it without Kyrie. He's no, had an absolute KD, brilliant start. He plays regular <laughs> basketball. No, we'll discuss more on this in a little bit. Antoine, thank you so much for hanging out. We, we got to take a turn. Talk some Josh Allen and the Buffalo Bills. A 4-2 and two start sitting at the top of the AFC East. We're going to chat one of Allen's top targets, Pro Bowl receiver Emmanuel Sanders. Next, talk all things Buffalo. A busy first things first. First things first, let's head up to Buffalo. How about the Bills? 4-2 and two start to the season, right where they want to be coming out of the bye week. How about this? Buffalo currently with the second best odds to win the Super Bowl. Big reason why? Their MVP candidate quarterback, Josh Allen. Allen will tell you, big reason why? One of his top targets, Emmanuel Sanders. Four touchdowns already to start his 12th season in the NFL. And to cap it off, how about an appearance on First Things First? With that, we say uh, good morning, Emmanuel. Thanks so much Treat. for being with us. I'm going to jump right in. Yeah, I'm going to jump right in. You guys are 4-2 and two right now, clicking on all cylinders. Uh, you're just making it look easy. Whether it is actually easy or not, how confident is this Buffalo Bills team right now? I mean, we we extremely confident, and you know why wouldn't we? Uh, you know, we we put the work in. Uh, you know, I joined this organization, and I you know I knew I knew what I was joining, but I didn't know I was joining like uh, joining Josh and uh, you know this just this organization who's doing everything the right way to try to bring a championship to Buffalo. It feels good to be a part of it. You know, obviously, you know we yeah, you say we sitting at four and two right where we want to be, but. You know, in my eyes, obviously, we would want to be 6-0. and But, you know, that, that we're not capable of that, and I feel like we could be that. You know, we're a couple plays away from being that. But at the same time, you know, I feel like we're playing good football. I feel like we got a great football team, and we just, just got to keep stacking wins and keep getting better. Well, it's nice to be joined by who I do believe is the only Buffalo City resident that doesn't viscerally despise me. So thank you very much, <laughs> Emmanuel, for joining us once again, friend of the show, uh, to join us. I, so I want, you mentioned, I got two questions for you, so let me start with this one. You mentioned you'd love to be 6-0. and oh. Throw week one out. There are some weird week one results. Your guys was one of them. The one that I imagine stings is the one that came right before the bye because you were so close and it doesn't end up going your way. Was that the worst time for a bye because of the way that game ended? Like if you get the touchdown, you win, you won five in a row, or did it stick with you a little longer than otherwise it would have? Of course, because, you know, after that, we had like five days off. and It took me like two days to really start enjoying my bye because – I was still in audit, you know, on, on fourth and one that, you know, we weren't able to get that and win that game. And, you know, I sit back and you look at the schedule and you say, OK, we got KC on the road. We got Tennessee on the road. I said, man, if we can go 2-0 and in those games, man, that, that, that'll really, like, you know, put the league on notice. And so, you know, I really wanted to win that game out in Tennessee and we weren't able to do it. So you kind of entered a bye. You kind of entered a bye with a weird feeling coming off a loss. But... 
it's one of those things that, you know, two days ago when I was watching the games on Sunday, uh, Sunday, I'm like, all right, I'm ready to get back to work. I'm ready to get this bad taste out of my mouth. I know that we have a good football team. I, 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 I would never, ever doubt that. I know what we're capable of doing. I know that, you know, if we can get high in the playoffs, what we're capable of doing, I obviously try to bring a parade to Buffalo. But at the same time, yeah, that 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 uh, that loss did sting. But at the same time, you know, I'm I'm on to Miami just trying to trying to get back on the same page and try to, you know, get back in the win column. All right, let me ask a positive question since that one was a little negative. Do you think no, you Diggs and MC Cole Beasley <laughs> are the best receiving trio in the league? Oh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not even going to get into that topic, but, you know, I, I'll take my guys over over everybody, you know, in terms of, you know, how we how we go about having a lot of business. You know, I think Diggs is, is one of the best receivers in the league, and then Cole Beasley is one of the slot receivers uh, in the league. And then myself, you know, I, I feel like I bring experience, a uh, 12-year veteran, uh, you know, I, you know, I've been around, but, uh, you know, a lot of people say, why is he bouncing around? But I'm bouncing around on my own time because I'm actually enjoying going to teams and playing with different quarterbacks and trying to win a championship and trying to win, win another Super Bowl ring. You know, I've been to three Super Bowls. And I've lost two and won one. And so, you know, it's really been on me in terms of signing these one-year deals, trying to get another ring because uh, I've been heartbroken two times and I'm just trying to even the score. And so, uh, you know, my I, I feel like I feel like even our fourth receiver and, and Gabe Davis, nobody talks about but This guy last year was just – just uh, just phenomenal, you know, as a rookie. And you see how he works in practice. And you're like, man, this guy can easily start for any NFL team, you know. And so, you know, I, like I said, I take my guys over anybody. Emmanuel, I, I don't know if you caught that in Nick's question, but he, he referred to Cole Beasley as MC Cole Beasley. And we know yeah. he's a rapper. Yeah. Are, I'm asking you this. Are you bumping <laughs> Cole's album in your headphones before games? <laughs> Uh, not not before a game, but a few times. You know, he he sent me he, he sent he sent me his stuff like on the plane. I listen to it. I listen to his music on the plane and stuff like that. You know, me me and Cole go way He's back. Right. You know, I've 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 been knowing Cole since yeah. our SMU days. You know, we played college together. So yep. I remember when Cole came in, he was a quarterback, little scrawny quarter. Uh, you know, quarterback transfer to receiver coming to SMU. <laughs> so that's my boy. So whenever you send me some music, I'm always going to listen to it and, and, and give him my opinion on it. And, but one thing it is, is, is if, if the music starts coming before him making plays on the field, I'm going to be like, I don't want to hear it. Like, let's make some money. <laughs> but he's doing, he's doing both. So I, I respect right. it. I respect it. Keep, keep the main thing the main thing, right? All right, all right. Speaking of quarterbacks, You've been blessed, man. You played with Big Ben, Peyton Manning, Drew Brees, all Hall of Famers in the future. What what traits do you see from Josh Allen that are similar to those guys? I mean, everything. Everything. I mean, I mean, he has it. And he, he, he's special, man. Uh, just, I think just from one thing that those guys didn't have that he has – is that the zip on the ball. I mean, you look at this throw right here. I mean, this throw right here shocked me, dude. Like, I mean, it was literally 40 yards on the line, rope. The DB thought that he could be able to undercut it, and it just was on a rope so long that, you know, it just literally just ended up right in my hands and just throws he makes and the plays that he makes with his legs. I mean, I played with Ben, and Ben was able to scramble around and, and make the plays like that, but this guy's. Like, KC, we got the game-winning drive. And, you know, I just, this one I really noticed. Like, I've already known, like, how special he was in training camp. But, I mean, the guy runs and jumps over the fender just to get, just to get the first down, goes down and scores, and then walks up to me and just just so excited and just, you know what I mean? Like, it was just it was just a, a surreal moment. It was just crazy. Uh, I mean, he, he's a special player. And he, he can be a special player in this league for a long time. There it is, right there. Like that play, I mean, right there, shocked me. Yeah. I, was, I, I didn't know. I didn't know he was capable of doing that. Once he did that, I was oh. like, "Hey, man!" I mean, with his arm talent and his running capabilities, and the offense with Brian Dable and the receivers that we have, I mean, we all know that we got an opportunity to do something special. But at the same time, we got to keep putting the work in. Emmanuel, who have you been impressed by the most in the league? Not necessarily. We'll take all of your teammates out of it, just so you can give us a, a, a scope of the entire league. Who have you looked at and said, ooh, 
That performance this year has really caught my eye. Oh man, uh, you know, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm always rooting for Lamar, Lamar Jackson, just because of how they did him when he came into the league. Like, I, I, I didn't like how they did him in the league, and I still don't, I still really don't kind of like how everybody still kind of questioning a guy. He can never do enough, and every time he does something else. He can't throw for 400 yards, and then the next thing you know, he does it 400 yards. Now, yeah, he, he, he can't win it all. He can't do this. And it's just like, man, when he first came in the league, everybody was saying that this dude wasn't even a quarterback. Next thing you know, he's the MVP on the cover of Madden, and one of the scariest players. Like, I, you know, I, 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 played, I played against him like two years ago, and I've never seen coaches so nervous about scheming up a player and worried about a single player hmm. uh, in terms of the type of player he was. And so, uh, man, he, he's special. And, you know, he, you know, you know, I'm always rooting for a guy like that. But also, you know, Kyler Murray and the way that he's performing this year and the way that the Cardinals are performing. Like, those guys, man, you know, I'm, I'm happy for them. But at the same time, I'm in the league as well. So I'm like, all right, we'll, we'll, hopefully we get to see those guys, you know, in the big game and, and see how it all plays. But, Kyler Murray's making some special plays out there. He's doing some special stuff to keep his team in the game. And like I said, I was in that division two years ago, you know, when Kyler Murray was there. And just to see this dude, this dude, like, squirming around, I'm like, on the side. I'm like, somebody, please tackle this dude. Like, just just grab him or do something, you know. But he, he's a scary player as well. And he can throw the ball, deliver the ball. So, I mean, he's having, he's having a crazy year as well. All right, well, before you go, uh, two things. First one is this. I think Emmanuel Sanders has taken the title of best active athlete interview analyst in the history of this show. I mean, this is just, I just well, want to yeah, keep you on for an hour and a half. It's fantastic. Like, I mean, this is, I don't know if this is, if you're putting this on like an audition tape for like to get a TV job when you're done going to Super Bowls or what it is, but you're spectacular. And I gave you that compliment because now I have to ask a very controversial question about a teammate of yours. How is Stefan dealing with being the second best football player in his family? Is it has been tough on him? <laughs> like how's it how's it going for him? Because Trayvon's gonna win Defensive Player of the Year. Yeah, that, hey, that's that's Diggs' brother, man. Like it's crazy because like uh, they'll they'll be playing and we'll be on the field and his brother will catch an interception and Diggs will just be going crazy, you know. But obviously, you know, we got to dig into him a little bit because at one point. <laughs> um, you know, uh, Trey he had, had more touchdowns than Diggs. Stephon. Yeah, exactly. Yes. So yeah. we were digging it to him. You know, Isaiah McKenzie, he's one of them guys. He always going to tell the truth. He go, hey, man, like, we don't care who you are. You was all pro last year. Shut up, your brother played DB, and he has more touchdowns than you. But, you know, Steph is one of them types. He's just laughing off because at the end of the day, him and his brother, they, you know, if you see their off-season workout videos when they competing against each other, the way that they go at each other, it's so fun to watch. But, you know, they brothers, they got so much love. He happy for his brother. Extremely proud of him. It was a lot of fun. Emmanuel, thank you so much. We really appreciate your energy Thanks, uh, yeah. this morning. Wish you all the best of luck for the rest of the season. Thanks for stopping by. All right, by. thank you guys for having me. Oh. Uh, Thanks, We're going to take a turn, talk some Baker Mayfield. The Browns are ready to pay Baker the big bucks, but would it be a big mistake for Cleveland to extend the former number one overall pick? We'll ask these guys next. First things first. Almost turned me into a Bills fan. Oh, oh, we're back goodness. here with our guy, LeVar Arrington, and we, uh, hey. we're talking the three and four Chiefs and where they go from here. Hey. Where do we even begin, LeVar? Honestly, Patrick Mahomes had the worst game of his career. He's been under duress constantly by defenses and by Chris Broussard. And speaking of defense, the Chiefs D, one of the league's worst, not stopping the run, not stopping the pass, not pressuring the quarterback, but otherwise they are fantastic. So can they, will they get this thing turned around? Andy Reid thinks he's got the locker room to do it. Take a listen. I thought one of the positives... Pete was <laughs> on the plane. You know, all the guys have these iPads now. So on the plane, they all had the game on. They were all looking at the game in the back of the plane. And it wasn't, you know, the, the loud music or whatever you can perceive to be co that goes on in the back of the plane. This was focused on trying to get better and, and looking at it, curious to see, you know, what went wrong. And so I can handle that. That, that normally tells you you got a pretty strong locker room. And and uh, and we need that right now. 
LeVar Arrington, those Chiefs with those crazy iPads, you buying that the Chiefs' strong locker room can turn this season around? Uh, listen, any strong locker room can have a profound impact on where you're going and where you're going to end up during the course of a season. So with that, I will agree with Andy Reid on the idea that a strong locker room can make the change and be the difference in your season. We're not too far away where they can't climb back into what it is that uh, is that that I guess right now. Is it a wild card race or are you still trying to fight for the division? Maybe they're even trying to still fight for a divisional uh, berth and crown in, during the course of this season. The biggest problem I have and the biggest concern that, that I'm looking at right now is even though you have guys that are, are aware that they're struggling and you have the locker room which says that you have the leadership to turn around what's going on, if you had that leadership now to change things moving forward, then that means that that leadership was there before you got to this moment in time where you needed to make that observation that you have the leadership to go forward. Now, that might have went over a couple people's heads, but let me bring it back to you. <laughs> that means if you have the locker room to be able to climb out of this, then doesn't that mean you should have had the locker room to not allow you to get to this and so to me, the biggest concern is even though you may have the leadership in that locker room and you may have the guys in the locker room that have proven that they could be guys, they may not be able to change this just based off of leadership of your players. You might have to change philosophically what you're doing because your defense is failing, your offense seems to have been figured out, and it's not leading to good results and that has to be the major concern right now. So, listen, there's no defending the performance on Sunday. And LeVar is obviously correct that the leaders, it's not like they just got an infusion of leadership. It's the same personnel in the locker room. I reject the idea the offense has been figured out. Even with Sunday's performance, they are a top five offense in every significant per drive or per play category. So I don't, I, Sunday was terrible in all accounts, but over the course of the season, the offense is still gaining first downs at a higher rate than any team in the league, successful on third downs at a higher rate than any team in the league. The problem is twofold and it's massive. The defense is a dumpster fire and Mahomes has turned, gone from a very low turnover quarterback to a shockingly high turnover quarterback. But Wilds, I want to throw something to you here. Because I think the fact that we are asking this question answers this question. Because there is a reason that despite being three and four, despite right now being out of the playoff race, that the Chiefs, not just on this show because I'm on it, on every show, are still one of the lead topics of conversation. Or this, this, it's all oh, because of the preseason expectations? No, because Seattle... Wilds is preseason Super Bowl pick, by the way, America, uh, is two and five, and they have been forgotten. About. Oh, wow. The Niners, who had a lot of preseason hype, are two wins and have been forgotten about. The reason the Chiefs are still a top level topic is because deep down, and this is what I want to throw to you, even the biggest Chiefs critic, of which I think Kevin Wilds has become, you know, number one in America, deep down, there is the sense. <laughs> If they get this right, they're scary. So I'm just curious, like, do you do you believe that it can be turned around or should we should we dispatch of the Chiefs the way we have dispatched of your beloved Seahawks as an irrelevant team for the remainder of okay. this football season? Okay. No, you I'm trying to take I'm shots asking. at the prognosticator curious. of prognosticators just because I'm three for three in my upset <laughs> alert. Stay tuned, everybody, for Friday. I'll turn this into a tease where I've got a spicy take for you on upsets. So, yeah, I picked the Seahawks. Go Badgers, Russell Wilson. Yes, I do think the Chiefs can turn it around. At the same time, did I click on an article oh. that said Mike Tyson might fight Logan Paul? I did. But you know why? I'm always interested in the formerly great players. I'm like, ooh, I'll watch that. Oh, so, yes, I do think, great. Broussard, the Chiefs, they are, but, but the, the Chiefs can turn around. The other thing I'm interested in the Chiefs is the mystery around what's happening to them. That's why I think it's so drama-filled. If we talk about, like, why my poor Seahawks aren't playing well, well, the defense stinks and Russ is out of the game. If we talked about why the Patriots... 
America's favorite dynasty. Ah, oh, we missed a field goal against Tom Brady and had a lot of penalties, but Mac Jones, and we have a rookie quarterback, is getting better. I don't understand what Patrick Mahomes is doing, and I don't think anyone does. Is he pressing? Are guys not open? Does he feel like he needs to have the 14-point play? The fact that the baby goat, and I think like we were joking around the calling of the baby goat, but I think everyone thought that like Tom Brady is here and then Patrick Mahomes is right there, has fallen so far is a fascinating story. And I haven't heard the, the single answer to why Patrick Mahomes' play has fallen so far, Broussard. That's why I think they're interesting. I said it. I gave you an answer. But go ahead, Broussard. Go ahead. What is it? Go ahead, LeVar. Ooh, okay. No, go ahead, no, Broussard. Go I gave you guys the answer. Well, more. Oh, well I mean, uh, look, Nick, Nick rejected it. But, I mean, just because you rejected it, Nick, doesn't mean that it isn't truth. There has been a level of understanding as to how to defense this offense. And, and it came out of the Super Bowl of last season, and it has continued on. You don't, you don't dominate a team the way that, that Tennessee dominated them by accident. That's not by happenstance. We, what are we looking at? Are we going to say it's injuries? Do you realize that, that this team was, was literally almost blanked? Blank. They were blanked in the first half, scoring the third quarter, don't score again. That's figured yeah. out. That's figured out. And and to me, either either mm. and this is something I went against Andy Reid for the duration of my career. So I have a very firm understanding of who he is and how his his personnel uh, is used and how they prepare for games. He does the same stuff with tremendously large amounts of different ways of getting to doing the same things. If you guys go to one of our prior shows back heading into the Super Bowl, I pointed it out to you guys. His new thing is he wants to get Tariq Hill and Kelsey in the center of the field, in between the the, the numbers all the way to the center of where in, inside of the hash marks. Those are the sweet spots that he wants to hit. And whether it's by gaining time for from from Mahomes, you know, moving around, whether it's by moving the defense around with fast plays to the outside, running the ball or quick screens so that you can get that the defense moving out instead of converging in. He's opening it up for the windows to be in the center of the field. And if you think that these defensive coordinators haven't got a tab on that and are saying, listen, here are the things we got to do. These are the tendencies that they're showing. And no matter what it is that they do to try to confuse us, understand that this is where they're trying to go. And I think that that's what defenses are doing this year. That, okay, but, the, but the, well, then it's not working, though. Because you said I it rejected is it. The reason I... Hold on, wait a second. Working. The reason I rejected it is prior to the Titans game, the Chiefs were the number one scoring offense per drive and per play in the league. After the Titans okay. game, built into it, that terrible performance, they are still top five in everything offensively. Rush, rushing efficiency, passing efficiency, points per drive, all of it. Third down conversions. So this, I like... Like the idea that the offense has been figured out, I just I, I don't think there's evidence of it whatsoever. Now they are turning the ball over at an absurd rate, but almost to Wilds's point, when you look at the turnovers, it's not like bad reads. It's a combination of four of the interceptions have hit receivers in the hands. That's not anyone figuring something out, and three of them have been just indefensible bad decisions by Mahomes while being tackled trying to throw it up for grabs. So I just, I don't think there's evidence, Broussard, that the offense has been solved. I think I think it is more so even a bigger indictment on the defense that with the offense scoring at the rate it had been scoring, they still were struggling the way they were. Well, look, I'm still a believer in the Chiefs, Nick, like you are. In fact, maybe more so, you were in panic mode yesterday. I was just disquieted. So I, I still believe they can turn it around. 
All right, but there is evidence that they figured something out against the Chiefs because they only had three points the last game. That's the lowest amount of points they've scored since Andy Reid has been in Kansas City. Obviously, it was Pat Mahomes' worst game. You're right. A lot of the turnovers and Mahomes' and some of his poor decisions are self-inflicted. But they, they figured something out. We know cover two, don't blitz, so you can keep so many back, guys back in the defensive backfield that you can cover the receivers. I want to throw this back at LeVar for a quick answer, though. You said they figured out Andy Reid and what he's trying to do. That's different than they figured out Pat Mahomes. Now, which one is it? Is it just they figured out Andy Reid? Is it that they figured out Pat Mahomes? And at least for a while, he's not going to be the quarterback we've come to know Patrick Mahomes to be. Well, think about it. They could have easily lost that Cleveland game, right? They pull out that Cleveland game. There's really only been maybe one to two games that they won that you say, okay, they won that game. And again, if you're, we can say they figured out Andy Reid or they, they figured out Patrick Mahomes or didn't figure out one or the other. But the bottom line is they're not scoring enough points to win games. So whatever the game plan is, even if it's the defense that is the catalyst for Kansas City losing, the offense has been able to overcome everything in the past. They've overcome. In the last two years, they've overcome. That's correct. They're not overcoming deficits. So to me, you figured their offense out. You figured their defense out because you're able to put up more points than Kansas City. And the reason being is that you're shutting down the run game and the center of the field. Center of the field, run game. If they can reestablish running the ball and find where they throw the ball again and reestablish that, they might start winning again with the talent that they have on this team. Until then, you got to deal with might. hoping that your locker room is strong enough to, to pull through where you're at right now currently. Andy Reid seems to think it is. LeVar, thank you so much for joining us. Always a Thanks good time. We've got to take a turn. Nick has to hand out some NBA medals. DeMar DeRozan showing out last night against one of his former teams, the Raptors. 26 points, including 11 in the fourth, to help Chicago improve to a perfect 4-0 on the young season. How about that? Bulls undefeated, but DeRozan just missing out on a medal. Nick, which guy, three guys did it better last night? Well, we'll start with shout out to the Bulls, only undefeated team, or the only undefeated team in the East, I should say, left. Let's go to Giannis, bronze medalist Giannis Antetokounmpo. A nice hum humble ho hum, 30, 10, and 9 for the defending Finals MVP, and a nice bounce back win for the Bucks over the Pacers. Silver medal, Jimmy Butler. I almost gave him the gold, but the, we'll see. He gets the gold in a second, but Jimmy, 36 on 71 percent and five steals for Jimmy Butler. A little theft from him, and then the gold medal, Jason Tatum, bouncing back after a really, really tough, very early part of the season. Tatum, 41 points, seven rebounds, eight assists, in a what turned into a double-digit overtime win for the Celtics. That might have been offensive goaltending, but Tatum with 41. There it is, Broussard, <laughs> the medal stand from yesterday in the NBA. Well, I am absolutely shocked that you gave Jason Tatum the gold, considering how down you've been on him over the years. All oh that means to God. me, Nick, is that you right no longer him. you you no longer consider the Celtics a threat in the East. Like they're they're just you know they're an also ran sure. Jason was well, great. They are. That they're no threat true, to but you it's got nothing to do with it. East. I am. So. You know what? Hold on a second. Let's stop the show before we get to miss the cut. I am sick and tired, Broussard, of you impugning my journalistic credibility. The medal stand like the tears, like the player pyramid, has nothing to do with anything other than a sober, cogent analysis of the night in the NBA. I'm going to demand I'm a written retraction. Nick. My What's God, up, well, enough We just enough. missed the cut last night. <laughs> Dripping in objectivity. John Collins, most underrated dunker in the NBA. Atlanta beats the hapless Pistons. Still looking for the first win. John Collins got not one, but two great dunks here. Just oh. missed the cut. Where's my apology? Nowhere near the cut. Ooh, Anyone on the flies. Lakers? They're still trying to figure out how Russ Mello and all the new pieces fit around AD and LeBron. Can they bounce back from a slow start? Can they? Next, first things first. Outrageous. 
The World Series begins tonight, 7.30 Eastern on Fox and the Fox Sports app. And David Ortiz giving away $25,000 for game one tonight on the Fox Bet Super 6 app. We're going to help you win big copies money. One of the questions, who wins and by how many runs? Nick, what do you think? Astros by two. I think the Astros start the World Series off with a win. I think it's low scoring. Four to two Astros. What, you rolling your eyes? Broussard, you and I are gonna have a long talk after today's show. Impugning my credibility, questioning my baseball picks. We got big problems, buddy. What's your take, my friend? It's very entertaining. You're for the rest misreading. Of us. You're completely misreading me. Not unusual. I, I actually was gonna say the Astros by two. I've got the Astros winning the oh, series in six games. Oh. <laughs> I was literally going to say Astros by two. So you stole my thunder. That's why I was oh, rolling okay. my oh, But sorry, I'll, I'll stick with it now. Astros by two. Astros by two. All right, Jen. I think Atlanta I comes out tight. Astros come out. Been there, done that. I think Astros by five. By five, Jenna. Correct. By oh. five. Blowout. By five. All right. Well, I had Astros by two, so now I don't know what we're going to do. Well, you know how this works. You just got to scan the QR code, download the app, and play along with us for free. You got to answer six questions uh, about this game before first pitch tonight. Don't miss out on your shot to win money. These guys just told you and me what's going to happen. It's easy. So go ahead and do it. All right. We're going to finish up this morning in the NBA. We're just a week into the NBA season. How about those new look Lakers? They're only one and two. Sports Illustrated actually ranked the Lakers all the way down at 20th in their first NBA power rankings. Nick, do you think people are overreacting or underreacting to the Lakers' slow start? Well, having them 20th is a massive overreaction, but that just shows a fundamental right. flaw with power rankings as a whole, which is why the sports world eventually will go to a tier-based <laughs> system the way they should. However, yes. here's what I've decided, Broussard. I want the Lakers to struggle early because I don't want them to get confused that playing a center alongside Anthony Davis for big minutes can be the right strategy. Once you acquired Russ, you, you, for all the good he brings, the bad is he's going to hurt your space, spacing massively. You can't compound that by having fossilized DeAndre Jordan or Dwight Howard out there. So I, I don't want Vogel to think, oh, well, Roy Hibbert, remember that? It worked. And JaVale McGee, it worked. No. So I, I, don't, I think the Lakers will be fine if they recognize their two biggest players on the court need to be Anthony Davis and LeBron James and then surround that with Russ and a couple shooters. That's what needs to happen. Until that happens, I think the offense is going to really be stuck in the mud. Okay, I'm with you on that, Nick. And, and Wiles brought this up earlier, though. Why isn't Anthony Davis at center? I mean, he's always said his whole career he doesn't want to play center. Has he told, you know, Vogel, you know, I, I'll play it here and there, but I really don't want to start there? I mean, because right. it doesn't make any sense, to your point, for DeAndre Jordan to be out there now. For all the hand-wringing about the offense, they are second in the league in pace. They lead the league in three-point mm -hmm. shooting. We know Melo's not going to continue to shoot 60% from behind the arc. LeBron's not going to continue to shoot 48%. So that'll come down. But the offense hadn't really been the problem. It's been the defense, Wilds. They are 25th in the league in defensive rating. And that goes somewhat to Nick's point about having a big center out there. They can't guard the younger faster Correct. teams that are kind of running them ragged. If you look and at these games, I'm watching these games and I'm like, man, they look good offensively. I mean, they're hitting shots. Westbrook's dropping nice dimes. Why are they only up by five? Why are they only up by three? Oh, they're down and the offense looks great because they're not guarding anybody while they got to fix the defensive end. Look, the, the Suns scored a bunch of points, the Warriors scored a bunch of points, and Steph didn't have a good game, and Ja put up 40. They could have lost that game, Nick, if Ja hits those free throws, sends it into overtime. If we can show the stats on the defensive rating, how good they were last year. The other thing is second chance points. Maybe this is a Dwight Howard, DeAndre Jordan thing, Nick. I can't tell. For me, I sort of wanted to wait and see. They play Spurs, Thunder, Cleveland, Rockets. I assume the defense is going to get on track here, but if they struggle against those teams, they should go 4-0 and here, I would say, you know what? This isn't just a small sample size. This is a fundamental problem with the roster. Yeah, 
And I understand like Broussard's point and your guys' point, which is the offense statistically has been fine. But the way for the Lakers' offense to be good is to dominate in the paint, which means, it's going to sound yeah. weird, smaller lineups because that allows LeBron to get to the rim. Because LeBron isn't going to shoot 50% from three. They're not going to be a great three-point shooting team. And if you're going to play big, being a terrible rebounding team is unforgivable. So I just, I think it's going to be a work in progress for the beginning of the season. I think the answer is staring them right in the face. When they acquired Russ, Jenna, they, AD said he was going to play center. I want to see it happen. Got to go.